The four daughters of Tsar Nicholas II of Russia are famous for their bloody deaths at incredibly young ages. They were, by all accounts, delightful people to be around, not just because of their royal status. The eldest, Olga, rejected many suitors to stay with her family. The second sister, Tatiana, was known to be quite beautiful and to carry herself in a very regal manner. The third sister, Maria, was overshadowed by her siblings, but was a very kind-hearted girl nevertheless. The youngest, Anastasia, was famous for a life she never lived. Let's meet these intriguing sisters. Grand Duchess Olga Nikolaevna was born on November 15, 1895 in the Alexander Palace. Russia still used the Julian calendar then, so her birth date was technically November 3rd. She was the eldest child of Tsar Nicholas II of Russia and Tsarina Alexandra Fyodorovna. Her father wrote, A day I will remember forever. At exactly 9 o'clock, a baby's cry was heard and we all breathed a sigh of relief. With prayer, we named the daughter sent to us by God, Olga. Her aunt, Grand Duchess Xenia, wrote that the baby was huge, weighing 10 pounds, and also that it was a great pity that she was not a son. Olga had many nicknames throughout her childhood, such as Olya, Olishka, and Olenka. She was mostly known for being a child who couldn't hold her tongue. Once when her portrait was being painted, she grew impatient and told the man painting her, You are a very ugly man and I do not like you one bit. Olga was joined by three sisters, Tatiana in 1897, Maria in 1899, and Anastasia in 1901. Their title in Russian translates to Grand Princess in English, but the British royals didn't want to be outdone by their Russian cousins, who were technically higher in rank, so they called Olga and her sisters Grand Duchesses. Olga and her sister Tatiana shared a room and were known as the Big Pair, while Maria and Anastasia shared a room and were known as the Little Pair. They all often dressed alike. Olga's mother, Alexandra, outraged her grandmother, Queen Victoria, by breastfeeding her daughters, something that noblewomen and aristocratic ladies barely did. Olga was an infant when she met her great-grandmother, the fearsome Queen Victoria. Victoria liked the little Olga and had this photo taken with her and her parents. Olga grew into a beautiful toddler with chestnut brown hair, bright blue eyes, and an upturned nose. Her tutor said that she had sparkling, mischievous eyes. In 1901, Olga was a young girl when she fell ill with typhoid fever. The disease had killed many of her relatives and there was no guarantee that it would spare little Olga. She was very ill for weeks and just when her family would have begun to lose hope. Olga recovered. The last Romanovs had a very happy family life. One Christmas, Olga made a kettle holder for her father, despite her nanny telling her that he would have no use for it. Olga made it anyway, and her father liked her handiwork very much. Olga, as the eldest child, would always interpret stories in which the elder sibling was cruel to their younger siblings as simply the way that things should be. Olga was not fond of the queens in Alice in Wonderland, and thought that no queen would ever be that rude. Tsarina Alexandra was under loads of pressure from the people and from relatives to give birth to an heir to the throne. She had so far had four daughters, Olga, Tatiana, Maria, and Anastasia. But the Tsar, Paul I, had despised his mother, Catherine the Great, so much that he had barred women from the succession. After ten years of praying for a son, Alexandra finally got one, and she named him Alexei. Olga was able to go to his baptism, and she was quite excited about being able to attend a grand event. She had not been allowed to attend any of her sister's baptisms. Soon it became clear that Tsarevich Alexei, the boy who was to become the future Tsar and the only son of Tsar Nicholas and Tsarina Alexandra, had hemophilia, the disorder that prevents blood from clotting. Things that seem incredibly simple such as a cut could be serious wounds to Alexei. Many relatives had died as a direct result of this. Queen Victoria had passed the gene on to her second daughter, Alice, who had passed it on to Alexandra. Women carried the disease but never showed symptoms. Therefore, any of Alexandra's daughters, including Olga, could have been carriers of the disease, though they did not live to find out if they were. The family grew even closer to protect the fragile Alexei. Their only son's hemophilia was the beginning of the end for Nicholas and Alexandra. Shortly after, Russia went to war with Japan. It was supposed to be an easy victory for Russia, who thought that they had a superior navy. Instead, it was the first time a European nation suffered a major defeat at the hands of an Asian nation. While all this was going on, a mystic by the name of Grigory Rasputin paid a visit. Rasputin was known for his healing powers. He healed people using questionable methods, and even healed people over telegram. He seemed to be easing Alexei's pain, though he probably just took Alexei off the medication his doctors were giving him, aspirin, which made hemophilia worse. But Rasputin was making the boy feel better, so Alexandra and Nicholas decided to keep him around, the biggest mistake of their lives. Rasputin barely ever bathed and slept with quite a few women. His wife just acted like a disappointed mother and didn't even try to stop him. Once, a nurse accused Rasputin of raping her, but Alexandra didn't believe her and fired her instead. The family couldn't afford to lose Rasputin and their son. 
The monk prophesied that if he died, the family would lose their son and their throne within six months. Olga and the other Romanov daughters were close to Rasputin, and he was allowed to visit them in their bedrooms before they had gotten up and gotten dressed. Olga's aunt, Zinia Alexandrovna, heard of this and wrote, He's always there. He goes into the nursery, visits Olga and Tatiana while they are getting ready for bed, and sits there talking to them and caressing them. There were rumors that Rasputin had seduced Alexandra and the Grand Duchesses. Olga, as the eldest, was the center of many of these rumors. Nicholas and Alexandra's family members tried to warn them away from Rasputin, but they couldn't lose him, as that would mean the end of their son's life and the end of their dynasty. Amid all the turbulence, Olga was growing up. She received a great education, learning arithmetic, music, and many other subjects. Her favorite was always history. She was the most studious of her siblings and excelled in her studies. She read newspapers to keep up with what went on outside the palace walls and was more informed about the horrible situation of the poor than the rest of her siblings. A tutor wrote of her, the eldest of the grand duchesses, Olga, a girl about 10, very blonde with eyes full of mischief and a slightly retroussé little nose, was studying me with an expression that seemed like an attempt to find my weakest point. However, from this child emanated such a feeling of purity and sincerity that she immediately gained my sympathy. Olga idolized her father, wearing an icon of Saint Nicholas to honor him. She and her mother had a strained relationship. Alexander was frequently ill and always sad, but expected the best from her daughters. As the eldest, Olga was expected to be a good example for the rest of her siblings and to make sure they stayed out of mischief. When Alexei misbehaved in front of dinner guests, it was Olga who got the lecture from her parents. Once, Olga noticed a disabled girl, and once she learned that the girl did not have enough money to go to a hospital, she used her own allowance to make sure the girl could get the care she needed. In 1911, when Olga was 16, a ball was held, and now that she was considered a grown woman, she could attend. However, at the ball, Olga did not know how she was supposed to speak with the guests, and she was seen by them as unsophisticated and childlike. After she turned 18, the search for a husband commenced. She had many crushes on sailors and guards that worked for the family, but a Grand Duchess couldn't marry a commoner. Grand Duke Dmitri Pavlovich, Crown Prince Alexander of Serbia, and even Edward Prince of Wales were all considered for Olga. Olga hated the thought of marrying a foreign prince and having to move away from her family, so when the family went on a trip to meet Prince Carol of Romania, Olga was purposefully rude to him so that she wouldn't have to marry him and move to Romania. She herself said that she did not hate Carol, she just didn't want to leave Russia. In 1914, World War I broke out. During the war, Olga worked as a nurse with her mother and sister Tatiana. Maria and Anastasia were considered too young to be nurses, but they helped as much as they could. Olga fell in love with a wounded soldier she nursed, and when he was wounded again, she couldn't have been happier. Tsar Nicholas went to take the ceremonial role of commander of the Russian forces, leaving Alexandra in charge. Alexandra was German while Russia was fighting Germany, so this was a horrible choice. Alexandra had no idea how to rule and relied on Rasputin for advice. Naturally, the Russian people were enraged that a German and a smelly monk were ruling their country. Family members continued trying to warn her away from Rasputin, but she never listened. In 1916, Rasputin was brutally murdered by Grand Duke Dmitri Pavlovich, which certainly ruined his chances of marrying Olga and Felix Yusupov, who was married to the Tsar's only niece. Olga and her sisters were devastated, but Olga knew very well why Rasputin was killed, and that it was inevitable. And Rasputin's prophecy did come true. Not long after his death, the Tsar was forced to abdicate and the family was held under house arrest at Epatiev House. Olga and her sisters tried to have fun in captivity, and many photographs from this time show them smiling together. They learned how to make bread while under house arrest. Alexandra and Nicholas's health worsened, and so did Olga's. She reportedly lost weight and became very depressed while staying at Epatiev House. In the early hours of July 17, 1918, the family was told to dress and come downstairs quickly. They were taken to the basement where the guards lined them up and shot the family and some of their servants. The women had sewn jewels into their clothes and so they were protected from the gunshots. Alexei and Nicholas were not so fortunate and the Tsar and Alexandra were killed in the first round of gunfire. The Grand Duchesses were still alive but Olga and Tatiana were holding each other tightly and screaming in the corner before they were stabbed to death with bayonets. Olga was just 22. The bodies of the imperial family were not found and identified until many decades later, and since the execution had been carried out so secretly, how could anyone be sure if it ever even happened? There were many women who pretended to be Grand Duchess Anastasia, most famously Anna Anderson, but Olga, as the eldest child, was also the more practical person to claim to be. 
A woman named Marga Boots claimed to be Olga, and she was supported by Kaiser Wilhelm II and Olga's cousin, Sigismund of Prussia. Sigismund's mother, however, was not convinced. Tatiana Nikolaevna Romanova was born on May 29, 1897 at the Peterhof Palace. Nicholas wrote of the birth of his second child, the second bright happy day in our family. At 10.40 in the morning, the Lord blessed us with a daughter, Tatiana. Grand Duke Konstantin Konstantinovich was less pleased, who wrote that everyone was very disappointed. Tsarina Alexandra reportedly wept to see all the very disappointed people around her who had been hoping for a son and heir. Tatiana was known to resemble her mother while her older sister Olga resembled their father. Tatiana was regarded as the most beautiful of her sisters, and her birth was followed by the births of two more daughters, Maria and Anastasia. The sisters were collectively referred to with the acronym OTMA, the first letter of each of their names. Tatiana excelled at needlework and was much better at it than her sisters. She made them blouses and brushed her mother's hair if a maid could not be found. She frequently reminded her siblings to behave the way their mother would have told them, which earned her the nickname, The Governess. Tatiana was arguably the Tsarina's favorite child and always cared for her mother throughout her many ailments. Tatiana was also a very straightforward and kind person. The Tsarina once wrote that her daughter helps everyone, everywhere. Tatiana soon became infatuated with an officer who gave her a bulldog. She allowed the bulldog to sleep in her room, which Olga was not pleased with since the dog kept her awake at night. Tatiana was made an honorary colonel and assigned a regiment of soldiers, which she and Olga would regularly go to inspect. In 1913, Tatiana contracted typhoid fever and had to shave off her beautiful hair. By the time she grew it back, World War I had begun. Tatiana was just 17, but eager to help. She was old enough to become a nurse and took the pain and suffering of the soldiers much better than Olga. Olga had to stop working as a nurse since it took such a toll on her health, but Tatiana continued. She was very calm around the soldiers and her composure made them feel much better. After Rasputin's death, Tatiana was deeply devastated, but even more so when her father was forced to abdicate and the family was held under house arrest. Nicholas and Alexandra's health worsened, but Tatiana was there to care for them. During their house arrest, the Grand Duchesses caught measles and they all shaved their heads, so this was the second time Tatiana had to surrender her beautiful locks to a disease. When the family was taken to the basement to be killed, Olga and Tatiana survived the initial round of gunfire and were holding each other, quivering in a corner. They were then stabbed with bayonets. Tatiana died after being shot in the head. She was just 21 years old when she was brutally murdered. Maria Nikolaevna was born on June 26, 1899 at Peterhof Palace. The birth of a third daughter to Tsar Nicholas II of Russia and Tsarina Alexandra was a great disappointment and many began to fear that a male heir would never be born. Maria was named for her grandmother, Dowager Empress Maria Fyodorovna, but was nicknamed Mashka. Maria was a very cheerful girl with large blue eyes, which were known by the family as Marie's saucers. Her governess wrote that Maria was born with the smallest trace of original sin possible. Maria was so good that when she stole some biscuits and the Empress insisted that she be sent to bed, her father said that he was glad to see that his daughter was a human child, not an angel. Maria's older sisters, Olga and Tatiana, always excluded her from the games they played. When her next sister, Anastasia, was born, Maria was even more overshadowed by her liveliness. Once, the sisters were playing house and the others told Maria she could be the footman. Maria refused to be the footman and came back with a handful of toys, saying that she wanted to be the aunt who brought them presents. Maria was from then on treated much better by her sisters. While the family problems worsened, Maria grew into a very beautiful young woman. She had large blue eyes, long brown hair, and full lips. Her cousin Louis Mountbatten wanted to marry her and wrote, You could not imagine anyone more beautiful than she was. She was a very good-hearted girl and all her governesses and tutors liked her very much. Maria was just 15 when World War I broke out. Her older sisters, Olga and Tatiana, worked as nurses alongside their mother, but Maria and Anastasia were considered too young for that. The little pair still visited many hospitals, talking, joking, and playing games with the soldiers. Maria fell head over heels for an officer named Nikolai Dmitrievich Demenkov. Her sisters teased her about this, but she didn't mind. Maria dreamt of marrying a Russian and living in her home country forever with many, many children. However, Maria would not live to see her fantasy come true. When the family was massacred, the initial round of gunfire didn't kill Maria either, and she attempted to flee, but the doors were locked. She was shot in the thigh and was left lying on the floor, while the guards left for a moment, before coming back to kill Olga, Tatiana, and Alexei. 
The jewels that the women had sewn into their clothes protected Maria and Anastasia from the guards who tried to stab them with bayonets, but Maria was eventually killed, though we don't know exactly how. A man named Alex Vermeer claimed that Maria had indeed escaped and fled to Romania, and that he was her grandson. Anastasia Nikolaevna was born on June 18, 1901. The birth of yet another daughter was another disappointment to Anastasia's parents, Tsar Nicholas II and Tsarina Alexandra Fyodorovna. Nicholas had to go on a long walk to regain his composure before coming back to meet his fourth daughter. Anastasia was a very lively child who loved playing practical jokes. She overshadowed her sister, Maria, with her playfulness and energy. The Grand Duchesses were raised frugally, they slept on hard camp cots, took cold baths, and were expected to clean their rooms themselves, even though they had countless servants to do that for them. Anastasia was just 13 years old when World War I began. Her mother and older sisters, Olga and Tatiana, went to work as nurses, while Maria and Anastasia were considered too young for that work, though they did go and visit the soldiers. Anastasia's playfulness lifted the soldiers' spirits and helped them recover. Under house arrest, Anastasia did her best to pay no mind to the guards and have a happy life with her family. During the massacre of the last Romanovs, the initial round of gunfire failed to kill Anastasia, so she had to be bayoneted to death. The Grand Duchess was only 17 years old at the time of her brutal murder, and Alexei was just 13. For years, it had been speculated that Grand Duchess Anastasia might have survived her family's unfortunate execution. The most famous of Anastasia's many pretenders was a woman named Anna Anderson. Anna was supported by Anastasia's second cousin, Xenia Georgievna, as well as many other royals. Xenia allowed Anna Anderson to stay with her in New York, but Xenia's husband and Anna didn't get along and he threw her out of the house. Anna married a man who called her Anastasia and died in 1984. After her death, DNA tests were conducted using a sample from Prince Philip, Queen Elizabeth II's husband, who was a close relative of the Romanovs. It was revealed then that Anna Anderson was not Anastasia, however, her DNA did match that of a missing Polish factory worker. The fact that Anna Anderson was not Anastasia did not stop writers and filmmakers from creating stories of Anastasia's life after her family's execution. There have been countless reimaginings of Anastasia's story, had she survived her family, including one of my favorite musicals. All people claiming to be Anastasia or her siblings were shushed when the bodies of the imperial family were found and identified, then laid to rest in a funeral fit for a royal family. They were all interred at St. Peter and Paul Cathedral in St. Petersburg. The entire family was canonized in the Russian Orthodox Church. This still did not stop people from making even more movies, plays, books, musicals, and more about the youngest Grand Duchess. Tsar Nicholas II and Tsarina Alexandra's daughters lived fun and fascinating lives before meeting a tragic end in a basement, brutally murdered by guards to keep advancing armies from freeing them from house arrest and restoring the Russian monarchy during the Russian Civil War. The last Grand Duchesses truly deserved a chance to prove that they were good people, instead of suffering alongside their always beloved parents who were the ones who made fateful mistakes.